Welcome to The Laws of Style, featuring conversations on creativity, fashion, and the law from the leading edge of our economy and culture. Hosted by noted fashion lawyer, Douglas Hand. Uh, I'm your host, Douglas Hand, fashion lawyer and fashion law professor uh, and self-styled, well-dressed man. Uh, And today I am joined by good friend, uh, artist, uh, activist, uh, menswear designer, uh, Greg Lauren. Greg, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This is this is long overdue, my friend. Long overdue. I know. I, I know. We we've, we've talked about this for for years now. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm in the city, the city of your birth. Uh, where yeah. are you? Uh, where are you zooming in from today? I am I am coming to you live from from sunny Los Angeles. I am looking at a beautiful golf course. That is what I'm staring at behind you. I love it. I love that we are sort of the um, inverse of one another in that regard. You born in New York and living in LA, me born in LA and living in New York and, and both of us for huge stretches of time. Um, we're, we're both true hybrids, I think. I think that's fair to say. We're both, we, we have the DNA of where we're from and have completely embraced, you know, where we live and work. And I think it's, it's what makes it, it, it's exciting that way. I think to have the best of both worlds. I always wondered what LA was like growing up. And I, and I always thought it couldn't possibly be as interesting as New York. And now to be honest, I feel the, I feel the opposite, but um, interesting. it's a great creative place. So. Yeah. Well, let's start at somewhat the beginning. Um, I, I love the story of how you began in apparel design, which really the genesis for which was, was one of your art shows. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, to understand that, um, obviously, you know, I grew up immersed in the world of fashion and clothing and style. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that as long as I can remember, clothing and style really was, was how I was taught to see the world. I mean, it's literally everything was funneled through that lens. And interestingly, when I spent many years, you know, as a, as a painter, as, a, as an artist, and really working on, on in mediums where, that allowed me to ask questions about who we are and what we love and, and who, who I am and try to connect that to the world around us, um, at a certain point, I needed to explore my relationship with fashion. I needed to, resp- to explore this, this idea of the connection between one's identity and clothing and what we wear and, and how that affected image development and who we are, who do we want to be, who, who are we told we can be. And this idea of being told who you're allowed to be and this idea of image was extremely potent in my upbringing. I was, I was taught about a certain group of clothing, a, a kind of, um, you know, a hall of fame of garments that you learned to love, that you wore, and that defined what being a certain type of male was. And that included a whole array of male archetypes that were symbolically um, clothing represented each of those archetypes. And as an artist, I, I started to question these heroes and I started to take a look at this idea of, wait, these are beautiful, interesting things. Cary Grant, Gary Cooper, Fred Astaire, Marlon Brando, um, Steve McQueen, amazing icons of style that one should always understand and appreciate, but were they mine? I inherited these heroes. I, I grew up loving Rocky, John Travolta, Six Million Dollar Man was my Cary Grant, you Steve know, Steve Austin, man, yeah. Steve Austin. I, I, <laughs> I would, you know, you can't tell now because I'm rocking the full eighties <laughs> Kurt Russell mode, but I, um, I used to go to the, get my haircut and I said, I want to look like Steve Austin. So in order to explore my relationship with clothing, I came up with this crazy idea at the time that I would learn to sew. I had never sewn before. I would learn to sew and I was, I set out to make, every piece of clothing that I had been taught to love, that I had worn, that I had played the characters that those pieces of clothing made me feel like, and I was gonna make them out of paper. 
the same fragile Japanese paper that I'd use in my paintings and I was gonna hand paint them. And I remember, I thought, I don't know if I can do this, it's pretty crazy. And <laughs> I had this beautiful old Singer sewing machine that my mom who has passed away had saved. I don't know, she never, I never saw her use this machine, but somehow we had this 70s Singer machine, which is very heavy, very right. clunky. And I took that to this woman and I said, this a costume designer in LA, and I said, um, this is a costume designer who had worked with Elizabeth, my wife, who, and had understood how to make duplicates for actors. You know, you bring them something and they make a pattern of it. And I thought, I'm gonna go and take from my own closet and I'm gonna go to every flea market. I'm gonna find every piece that represented each of these icons and I'm gonna have a pattern made and make it out of paper. And I remember going to this woman, her name was Marilyn, and I said, can you teach me to sew quickly, <laughs> soon, like today? And I wanna make all these amazing pieces out of paper. And she looked at me, paused, there was silence. I thought, oh God, she thinks I'm crazy. And she said, okay, when can you start? And literally the next day I started going to this little shop, which is very typical of the California uh, film industry costume shops. I was going to Altadena every single day, surrounded by Irma and a few other people. It was like a reality show before reality shows. And, and I would walk in and say, hi guys, what are we doing today? And one by one, we took, we started with a dress shirt. Then we moved on to a peak lapel, blazer that had been we made a pattern from a charcoal english wool peak lapel blazer that that i could see you wearing maybe it's a little too wide lapels for you maybe maybe this is my peak lapel greg lauren blazer <laughs> I, yes. you know what that's the pattern <laughs> that pattern that you were wearing started with a jacket made out of japanese paper amazing and this jacket is made out of surplus military tent that jacket that you were wearing is made out of a vintage U.S. Army tent, a shelter half, which is what it's called, and over-dyed navy blue. That was my concept of how to it's reinvent gorgeous. the navy blazer. It's gorgeous. It, it, it has a, um, and we'll get into to your design aesthetic, and, and I don't want to break your flow, but whenever I'm in it, there is a, a very current, if not, you know, kind of, you are inhabiting a role a bit, a bit more but not in a bad way, in kind of a, a very capable, maybe feeling a little post-apocalyptic at times, mm -hmm. but you know, a very capable way um, and, and you know, ready for action. Yeah, no, and I, and I love that you're saying that because I think seeing you wearing that, by the way, I, I recently have thought about some of my earliest pieces um, that were new to the kind of collective consciousness then, um, I actually am planning on bringing them back because I think they're obviously very relevant now, not just because of what we're going through, but I think that, you know, I've always lived in the sustainability space, but I think more than ever, uh, you know, I love this idea of what if you had to make everything that you wear, you know, not unlike other things like, you know, only eating what you can make on your land, but what if you, what if we could only wear things made from what, we have available to us, that's it. Can't go yeah. shopping, can't go to a fabric store, can't, can't have it milled in Italy or England, but whatever is around you is all you have to use. I love that idea and you know, just to, to finish the story of, of how I started, that is how it actually began because I had made all these beautiful pieces that looked like something out of a classic men's store that could have been something out of a Cary Grant movie, would have felt at home at a beautiful Ralph Lauren store, which was obviously the, the connection to that, but they were all black and white. They were all crinkled and pinned to the, these mannequins that I displayed them on, but they were paper. And in a way it was almost like a, I hate to use this word, but a mausoleum of these classic styles. And as you walk through this black and white world of, of clothing that everybody, as they would walk through, they said, oh my God, my dad had a jacket like that. Oh, my grandfather had that kind of cool jacket. Oh my God, I have that. Or I wore that jacket to my first concert. It was like they were walking through a soundtrack or timeline of their own life, which is what I loved. And when you got to the back of the, the exhibition um, is where for me, the magic really started because 
as I was learning to sew and making all these classic pieces out of paper, I, there was this overwhelming thing that started to happen where I needed to make something wearable. And it was, now I, now I know that it was inevitable. I just didn't realize it at the time how, how unavoidable it was, how, how unstoppable it was. And the very first jacket that I ever made, which speaks to what we were just chatting about is, I, I had just made a blazer out of paper and hand painted pinstripes on it. I said, I need to make a jacket. And I looked around and it was in my art studio in Los Angeles. And I said, what can I make it out of? And I literally moved the chairs and the tables and I grabbed the drop cloth that was on, my, on the floor of my art studio. I had paint on it, had glue, a paintbrush was stuck to it. It was a mess. And I just shook it out and I made my first jacket and it was terrible. It was so bad. The left sleeve was on the right side. It was too tight. I had sewn part of it to itself, undid it, took the sleeve off. Um, and I was so excited about it that I just kept going. So if something didn't work, I fixed it. So by the end, you know, I had this piece that was so perfectly imperfect. And I was so proud of it with all of its right. scars and stitches and frayed edges that I wore it out that day like it was the greatest thing ever that, that I'd ever seen. And I remember I was, at, I was at, it was either a Whole Foods or it was someplace very normal. Something, I was picking up something and somebody walked by me and said, hey man, cool jacket. And I was like, oh my God, it, it works. Um, yeah, wearing your scars, battle scars, you know. Um, the, stories. The, the education, the stories, yeah. And, and what it represented for you, that's, that's fantastic. Um, well, obviously that show and your decision to, to, through your art, explore apparel um, was, was informed by the family. I mean, mm. your father is Jerry Lynn. Yeah. Your uncle is Ralph Lynn. Um, they are the captains of a brand that will stand the test of, has stood the test of time and will stand the test of time in terms of uh, being, you know, American classic, uh, being absolutely a behemoth in the industry, uh, being a leader in the industry for a lot of reasons, a lot of very, very positive reasons and have given uh, American designers a lot of hope. But what was it like growing up, but Lauren? I mean, geez, that's, that's a huge couple of shadows to be growing up. Yeah. It, it's unique, I'll tell you that much. Um, it's not what most people think, which is why my journey has taken the path it has. But what I will say is, first and foremost, um, imagine this. I'm watching Reggie Jackson, not to date myself, but I'm watching Reggie Jackson hit a home run in a Yankee game, sitting with my dad on the couch, finishing haagen ice cream. Maybe it was in Entom the very New York Entenmann's chocolate donuts. Game is over, turn the channel. There's an old Cary Grant movie on. So we've just gone from Reggie Jackson. And at that time, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a small child and I'm hearing my dad say, look at how that suit drapes. Look, look at this man, look at that suit. Isn't that beautiful, Greg? And I'm saying yes, and I'm understanding it. So my education of style and not a formal dress code, it's not what people think from what the ads later started to um, create and, and, and message. You know, the, it was this appreciation of all things that had to do with for good and for, for better or worse, how you looked, not physically, not superficially, how you looked, how you presented yourself, what that could say, the power of a jacket. Um, you know, I don't know if any other kids on the way to one of the many seventh grade bar mitzvahs were ever told that they looked, oh, I love your outfit today, Greg, you look very Duke of Windsor. You know, this is on the way to a bar mitzvah because I decided to wear I was having fun and I wore a striped tie with a check shirt and, I, and it's very Duke of Windsor. If yeah. I had said that to any of my friends, they would have thought I was absolutely insane. You know, and- Five patterns um, and, and three textures all mixed together, perfect. Absolutely, and may, I think I might even have, you know, maybe even the pocket square, you know? And so I think that the hardest thing about it is that, um, 
is that everything was held to a standard, a standard that I would say when you're a kid and you just want to be relaxed. And I think about this a lot with my own seven and a half year old son now. I don't want to impose that on him because in my world, it was very much, these are the things we love. This is why. Here are the examples of them, which were great examples. So you, you didn't feel very confident to question them. You're not going to question, you know, an army jacket that Stephen Queen is wearing or a suit that Fred Astaire is wearing. Um, even if there was part of me as a teenager that was liking Simon Levon and Duran Duran and going, that's kind of cool. I kind of like that. No, no, that wasn't allowed. That was not allowed. And so I would say, without it being about the formality of a dress code, there was pressure. There was pressure to get it right. And that could be from the perfectly faded t-shirt of which that existed. The wrong t-shirt was frowned upon. The wrong baseball hat was frowned upon. Um, you know, that was probably the negative side of it. It's just this, this, this idea of being told who to be, told how to dress to be like that, while having this amazing experience of actually understanding the beauty of patterns of menswear, the history of it. Um, the fun part was our dinner conversations, like other people talk about politics, academics, sports, we talked about style. And, and crazy hardcore debates happened over who was cooler, who was, you know, which was a better movie. Was Robert Redford and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance cooler than, than you know, Steve McQueen in Bullet? Um, you know, these were, these were debates. And does anybody now have that? sense of style of who's cool now, what is cool, what makes something cool. It was, it was really, really cutthroat. Um, but as we get older and as we're living in a time when men love clothing and wear clothing and want clothing, it was probably the greatest background to have because suddenly I was the guy telling my friends as we're getting for, we're ready for prom, not do man, I think you should wear a shawl collar. I think that would be, look better with that. No, you can wear that if you want. If you want to do that, okay. I wouldn't wear that bow tie. Or, I don't know, notch lapels might be a little boring right now for this. Maybe you want to do that. Or lose the cummerbund. Lose it. Because in my family, by the way, I don't, know, I don't even know what this means. I was told early on, we don't wear that. If you ever look at Cary Grant, never wear a cummerbund. Or, or Gregory Peck wore it a different way. And things like that where I became, you know, with my friends, they laughed at me or didn't understand it the first time I wore a pair of cinched, cut off military chinos that were way too big, but that reminded me of Ernest Hemingway. But soon, by the late teens, when everybody was having their breakfast club sense of self, we would go shopping together. And I was, I was the expert. Um, the, the challenging part of growing up with such a powerful image is that it's almost impossible to live up to other people's perception that those amazing groundbreaking ad campaigns created. Um, and as they got more and more fantastical and further from the truth, and I would say more and more sort of aspirational with quotation marks, I actually started to question that because I think that the shift that has happened in the latter part of like for you and me and for our lifespan is a certain sense of authenticity, um, a certain sense of self, a certain sense of, wait, can clothing show who we really are on the inside and not have us hide behind some armor of aspiration? I think that's where the contradiction has sort of happened. And I really felt that as an artist, like, wait, I, I don't, I remember the first time I wore like a vintage bowling shirt. With a, with a Hanes tank top with my tweed pants. My dad looked at me and said, I, what is that? I don't get it, what is that? And it was the beginning of me, I was, think I was in high school or, or just or in college, and I was experimenting and even experimenting had its boundaries or rules. And I, need, I needed to break free from that. So I, I, the upbringing was both a blessing and a curse, but one that I welcome because it allowed me to fight through and ultimately, you know, develop my own voice. So. Yeah. Well, and, and you've certainly done that. There is uh, a very distinct Greg Lauren look 
which uh, he translated across not only menswear but women's wear as well. Um, let's let's talk about the business. Uh, we're obviously at a moment for all brands that is uh, a very very difficult one. Uh, the pandemic has shut down retail uh, globally, so. Um, you know, your channels of, of distribution are impacted. Uh, and for many brands that, that don't produce themselves, uh, also uh, production facilities uh, have, have gone on hiatus. You have a very old school operation um, insofar as you actually make your own stuff. Um, so, so let's talk about that and, and what you've been doing during the pandemic. Um, and maybe working in, you know, your mask program, which uh, mm -hmm. has been a huge benefit to, to, to those uh, medical workers and others that uh, didn't happen uh, at the time that you were cranking them out. Yeah. Um, well, so, yeah, the, 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 the way that we've built the business really it goes back to kind of everything that you brought up in the theme of this. You know, I didn't. I say this now, I didn't originally set out to build a business to, you know, I set out to make artisanal clothing and then convince myself that that was this model that I, that I was intent on and proving I could do, which was to build a fashion company, a brand, have collections, multiple collections, you know, every year, but that were created with this artisanal approach to making clothing, which is completely antithetical to scaling and to production completely. So what I would say is the, the aesthetic started to inform the process and, and you know, the easiest way to understand it is I've always embraced and still to this day, we are an atelier making clothing. Um, an atelier that's not only making samples and the first pieces and the experimenting, but we really over time and through trial and error and and an understanding and having such a, it's all about the team. Anyone who tells you this, that it's, that it's, you know, otherwise is fooling themselves. I have an amazing team and I have people that have worked with me now for years who understand me, who understand the process, who I now trust. And we, we developed and kind of created an operational approach to artisanal clothing, to upcycling, to repurposing, that is the only way early on we could actually deliver these unique pieces that were mostly one of a kind to 80 to 100 stores around the world. Um, the volume was still low and there still is a need to scale. The challenge is that the first half of the existence of my company, we mastered delivering artisanal product globally, making as many as 50 to 100 pieces of, of a single style that was very handcrafted, but that we had figured out how to have teams sort the vintage materials, deconstruct them, sort the pieces. We have a no scrap goes unused policy. My, our warehouse looks like a, uh, an amazing Old West convenience store of odds and ends from grommets and snaps and buckles and duffel bag straps and each one now has a purpose and I spent years going, don't, don't throw that away. Do not throw that away. That's, that's going to be a beautiful collar. That will be a cuff. We'll use that as a button. Um, once the brand grew and with people like yourself being a huge part of that as the brand identity became global, you know, we do collaborations, started doing shows, then it becomes an unstoppable momentum. So, so you can't, stop the wild horses once they start charging. And what, what you we really learned how to expand the process, it's time consuming, it's tedious. You need people who don't mind sorting through 500 vintage tents because it's a tedious process that someone who comes out of fashion school doesn't know, wait, I didn't study for this, what am I doing? Um, the hardest part is trying to get to scale a business to support that. So we've had to find this, we, we sort of figured out how to do both and work locally with contractors here. We don't make anything overseas. Um, so we don't really make anything that is far enough away that we can't control it, see it, touch it, go that afternoon to see the product. Um, 
Our, the contractors we work with have to be skilled enough. We've, I've been thrown out of multiple contractors' offices who refuse to even attempt to make our product because each one is different. You can't stack the fabric. Uh, oh, I've asked them to change the color midway through a placket. And they look at me like, take your stuff and I don't ever see you again. Um, and, but the greatest thing about it is this is a perfect time where we could still make things. And unlike the corporations that I think New York and Europe that have built the fashion industry, um, there's a spirit in Los Angeles that, that I feel part of, which is we do what we want, when we want, and don't take no for an answer. And we are, we've built our brands like that. So no matter how large my friends or designers are and how, how many people suddenly we have working for us, if I say, you know what? We're making masks tomorrow because we can and we need to and we need to help. I don't have to go through 20 channels just to get it approved. Um, so that, that's the greatest thing about working the way I do is I can create a sample up until the day it has to go on a plane to fashion week and more relevant to what we're going through right now, as soon as this started, it was me. It was my decision with my team saying, guys, what, do we, what can we do? We have the fabric. My atelier head, Christina, had a pattern and we started making masks, which was really, really exciting. And, and it felt uh, powerful. It felt very empowering to be able to help just by doing what we do every day. What, we, what my team, and, and not a single person on my team questioned it, didn't want to be part of it. And I think it was just, again, there's a more and more, I think, the culture at companies is going to be something that is highly valued and not just the result, but the culture, the process, the relationships. And, you know, I've always treated my team and we have a very family style environment, which sometimes people, consultants come, come in from the outside and say, you know, you can't do that. You can't have such a family style thing. You need to have some separation, distance. And after this, I'm not so sure that they're right. I think there have to be boundaries, but I would say the more invested your employees feel in your mission, the more they will go to the mat for you and vice versa. And that definitely, I mean, I have people coming in every single day at the times when it was less certain, obviously doing it with the right restrictions, but making masks, including the first mask we made was a very innovative attempt at trying to solve the so, you know, provide a solution for the lack of N95 masks. That was the first week when everyone was trying to figure it out. And I would tell you that it was perfect and appropriate for what we do. We made masks by deconstructing store-bought air conditioning filters uh, from Home Depot and using those in our masks to try to create a filter system that would be on par with the N95s. And upcycling, repurposing, that's what we're known for, but I have never upcycled an air conditioning filter from Home Depot before now. And now, now I'm an expert at it. Right, right. Well, um, yeah, it was a great moment, I think, for the brand and I'm sure for the people at your company uh, to, to pull together like that. Uh, you've also done a lot of collaborations. We've mm -hmm. worked on a number of collaborations. I mean, Mastermind Japan, uh, Paul Shark, uh, Alan Newey. Uh, the list goes on and on. How do you find working with other brands, um, given how much creative freedom you have within your own brand? It's hard. Uh, you know, it's, it's challenging. Um, I've been really fortunate. And obviously, you've been a big part of each of these because it's, it's I think, doing a collaboration starts with a mutual excitement to work together. And that mutual excitement needs to be um, held back. And I'm certainly somebody, in, and, I, and you've been very kind, kindly said to me, Greg, hold on, wait a second, just chill out, wait a minute before we get too far, because I'm ready to go. But I think the collaboration is only as good as the mutual excitement is protected by a structure to the deal that you have with these collaborations, because that's where it can go downhill very easily. The excitement's great, it makes sense. I remember when, when the biggest collaboration that I did, 
and, and happened to be the first, which was Montclair. And that was forever, that was, my, that was my, and I think our textbook for at least doing a collaboration with Greg Lauren, because here is a global company, global, massive company, uh, very factory driven, very commercial, very restriction after restriction after restriction for how they do things. Suddenly pairing up with me, who's saying like, can you send me stuff that I'm gonna tear apart in my parking lot, stitch back together. They were, they, they were like, what, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. And the only way, that one came about because they were already in the process of doing collaborations. And what was beautiful is they weren't, they didn't need the collaboration to save their company. They already were looking to push the creative boundaries and be supportive of emerging designers. Greatest thing ever is to have a partner who really is collaborating because they want to let you run free. Those are the best. Um, and I made a few pieces where I took these fantastically beautiful Montclair jackets that I'd seen in Paris and Madison Avenue and in pictures, tore them up, destroyed them, and with my team and our approach, meticulously reconstructed them pairing shiny blue nylon with vintage duffel bags and tents and and it was the perfect to me it was the perfect collaboration the mixing of two dna and creating a new vocabulary out of each of our own the challenge which we worked very hard you and i worked very hard to to create were the the, the ground rules for this because in order for this one to be successful my team made everything which was a first we had to, so we had to create a relationship, both legal, economics, where everybody was okay with the process. And that took time. So it was kind of like, here's what I want to do with your stuff. Here's the only way we can do it. And then once they signed off on that, it was kind of creating that structure which protected us and allowed us to, to move through our channels properly. Um, I love collaborations. I think, I think the more the partners don't see eye to eye, the harder it is. Um, and I think that sometimes one partner doesn't fully know what they're getting into or they have a different expectation and that can be, that can sort of slow down or, or inhibit a collaboration. Um, I think you said it best as well. If, when neither side needs to do the collaboration and they are purely doing it from desire to work together, which has been yeah. a part of all of your collaboration. Um, I think those are, are when they function the best. Who do you want to collaborate with next? Ha <laughs> ha, that's a great question. Um, I would love to do a collaboration uh, with, with Dior. I think what Kim Jones is doing is fantastic. I think that um, it, it really is exciting to me when I look at a designer who has a completely different aesthetic and I can feel moved and excited and inspired by what someone's doing. And it's not envy because it's too close to what I do or, or I just look at that and I go like, that's a voice. So kind of like the perfect pairing in a song or two ingredients in a food that shouldn't go together. I would love to do something um, ideally with, with, with someone like Kim and Dior Overall, I think it's time, I'd love to do a collaboration with one of the sort of legendary houses because I think that that would excite me to see what I could do putting my aesthetic and my approach to something that is equally, if not greater in its connection to heritage, but a different heritage than mine. Like right now, what I do very well, and I think the space that I feel very confident in is is when someone comes to me to do what I do, which is take something heritage, take something traditional and do, do my thing to it. I understand that, I understand heritage, tradition, classics and giving it a twist, I think better than anyone. Um, I would love to do that with, I love Dior as it was originated and I love Dior now. And I think that it's, um, it is the, if you had to show, you know, maybe other than Chanel, but it's had a different kind of path. I think if you had to show an alien what a fashion house looks like, when you say the word fashion with quotation marks, it is Dior. 
That would be, let's make it happen. All right. Let's do it. For us. Uh, let's pivot a little bit and talk about business now being conducted like this mm -hmm. over phone calls, over virtual meetings, uh, and what specifically uh, business people uh, are going to be wearing on those calls. Um, I know that you don't necessarily design for your typical white collar professional, mm -hmm. but you definitely design for a lot of creative professionals. I mean, you have a stable of, of very loyal clients who are the upper echelons uh, of those areas. And um, how do you think this kind of almost waste up uh, viewpoint is going to transform the way people dress or is it not? Are people gonna, gonna put themselves together in some, the same way that they did? So I think it's, it's absolutely gonna affect everything. The question is to what degree? I think that, um, I think that first of all, I think that comfort, the word comfort and ease is absolutely gonna be kind of the defining term and, and we're gonna hear that over and over again. And what does that mean for everyone? You know, like the jacket you're wearing. What I'm proud of is that jacket is, to me, embodies both those words and depending on how, how somebody sees that, I'm not suggesting that they might wear it to sleep in, but that jacket, because of its tailored but unconstructed nature, I've had people tell me, I love to take your, your tent double-breasted blazer and roll it up, throw it in my bag, because it looks just as good when you take it out. And yet, just because of the, of the shape, when you put it on, it gives just enough of a silhouette to kind of feel like you, you know, if you're wearing it with sweatpants, if you're wearing it with track pants, if you're wearing it with a t-shirt, if you're wearing it with an amazing band collar shirt like you have it on, it just adds that final touch and it works because it feels tailored, but still rumpled, relaxed. So that I would use that as an analogy because my theme, and certainly my theme for my, the collection that I designed entirely digitally, which was a first for me, by the way, um, I work, my design process is, is all about the tangible connection to what I'm making. And I would tell you that I'm, I'm impressed with my team as well as myself in that the collection of which we are very far along with has been designed entirely using my iPad, Zoom, FaceTime, texting, and my stylus pen, you know, pencil and sketching on my iPad. Um, but the theme for me is comfort and protection. I think that to me, and what does that look like to me? I think that more than ever, the combination of things that feel comfortable, that feel relaxed with whatever makes you feel secure, if that means utility pockets, if that means throwing on a rumpled jacket that just brings your comfort level into a little bit more of a silhouette, which really is armor, if you think about it. To me, however we define that, I think that's what's gonna happen. I think you're gonna see a lot of people doing what those of us that have been more, maybe more uh, exposed to certain fashion contradictions already, more people will be wearing, throwing on a jacket or a shirt that they normally wouldn't have worn with what they wear to the gym. And I think that that is part of, that's been a part of our, our culture for a while, this kind of triathlon chic, you know, like, but usually we've seen it in the form of somebody intentionally saying, Dude, they show up to a meeting in there after going running 10 miles. And like, oh, I didn't get a chance to, to shower, man. And it's like, that's different. That's like, that's an irreverent choice to wear what you just wore while, while running on the West Side Highway to a dinner meeting. And you're, and you're boldly saying that's okay. I think that, that what we're going to see now is incorporating the different elements of comfort and fashion. I think there will people, be some people who are dying to put a suit on. I don't know when and where they'll get that opportunity. I think some people, there you go. I think some people will be like, I gotta put a suit on, I gotta tie a tie. I think there'll be some people who may never put on a pair of pants ever again that has a waist, you know, waistline or a fly. Um, in the middle, I think is gonna be this very exciting way, this, 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 how do people express themselves while being comfortable, while the sense of fear when we go out, this sense of how do I guard myself from all the things that are happening out there? Definitely ceremony is part of, and occasion is one of the reasons people dress up. Uh, mm -hmm. and those are in 
short supply. I mean, you're, you're, you may have small ceremonies within your family, but it's hard to feel that same sense of ceremony digitally. Although I think mm -hmm. the world is, 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 is moving in that direction. And I do think, um, you know, we were sort of gabbing before we um, started recording about doing Zoom calls when you feel like you're looking good, you know, uh, right. and, and dressing for Zoom calls um, and recognizing that, um, you know, th there's an opportunity for maybe a little more attention to the top half of your body. And, you know, I think I haven't put a pair of proper shoes and a belt on in a while. Right. I mean, <laughs> I'm a in my belt, socks right now. <laughs> a, a belt serves a purpose that is mooted by, you know, simply sitting uh, the entire time. In fact, it's quite uncomfortable when you're sitting. Um, but um, no, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting time. And I think um, people will get back out again. I don't think we'll always be Zooming, but I do think that uh, remote work will, will be uh, normal for, for many more than it has traditionally. And so, um, you know, there, w there will be a shift. But when, you, uh, when you first designed the line, um, did you have women in mind as well? And what are your thoughts about uh, unisex uh, design? Because I know a lot of women love your clothes and I know a lot of your pieces really are, they're just unisex. I don't think. That, that's the great question. Um, my heart and soul started with menswear because I think it's always, I think it's, there are different designers that design for different reasons with different, um, different passions you know i i was trying to answer my own questions so it's always a good thing just like a writer or, or or a filmmaker creating stuff from their own experience i was designing for myself at first so if i wouldn't wear it then i wasn't going to make it um so my design process has always been rooted in that kind of truth the very first women's jacket that i made was for elizabeth um i made it for her it was, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. And I actually, it was one of part of the art show. I made her a jacket to wear to the opening of my art show. And it was, the, it told the same story as the men's pieces. It was a sort of elongated tailored piece that had an attached vest. So it was basically me taking one of our menswear pieces and doing it for Elizabeth. Elizabeth happens to be, uh, happens to enjoy wearing pieces that are more, tailored and fitted. Um, so when I first started designing for women, which was very early on, and, and it was started more as a commercial, um, I, you know, it sounds like an ugly word, but I was told early on, like, Greg, where's the women's, where are the women's pieces? And I said, okay, let me, let me, let me see what th that looks like. What do I, how do I see women dressing? And for the first few seasons that I had a dedicated women's wear collection, it was very much the same story. It was, it was, who do you want to be? Who can women be? And there was a kind of very interesting uh, warrior, female warrior. Uh, women are the new men and are in roles of power and are in, um, you know, can do anything kind of approach. And the aesthetic fit that. So it was rooted in menswear. It was very tailored and fitted because that's what I knew. Um, and that's what I liked. What was interesting is purely from seeing the clothing be, be worn by people, we started to have a tremendous amount of women buying the men's pieces because the story was the same. So it wasn't like I had a completely different collection. They would pick up a piece and say, oh, is there a men's version of this? And I'd say, right here. And they would, they would buy the smallest size of the men's piece. And so I started to see that coming Pretty early on, I want to say about five years ago, I thought that's interesting. Do we need a women's line? Do we, you know, uh, this is getting a little trickier for somebody who is from, a, from my upbringing and what I was exposed to was that women's wear was women's wear and had its own dedicated silhouettes and patterns. And sure, there's always room for that fun boyfriend shirt or the boyfriend jacket. But um, when stores started buying for their women's, collection for their women's buy they were buying from the men's line sheet i thought this is interesting and when i was in the the heavy rotation of doing shows i felt like you have to deliver a women's show with dedicated women's clothing a lot of that even when i would have the show when people would come to the showroom they would still buy the men's pieces so 
the great conflict as a designer is exactly what you're talking about. I'd say two years ago, three years ago, more as a trend and as a movement, people, women who normally bought women, women's wear were buying men's wear. I think that from a bigger socially conscious kind of understanding of the world today, I think that there's less of a need to specify between men's and women's. Clothing is clothing. I think that in today's world, you know, it doesn't need to be gender specific and it shouldn't be. Um, there are no rules. There are no social people. It's about individuality. So I think that people are wearing what they want, regardless of who someone says it was made for. As a business, there is still a sector of women who want women's clothing that has been designed for a certain type of body type with a certain type of silhouette. And I can't tell you whether that is a smaller piece of the pie right now, but it is increasingly challenging to know who to design for uh, in terms of a women's collection when you're talking about commercial success or commercial approach. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out because again, it's across the board for us. You know, I, I try to do a women's version of some of our men's pieces for that specific female customer, knowing that my story is a unisex story anyway, if that makes sense. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about commercial realities today. Mm -hmm. um, this is a horrible time for retail. Horrible. Uh, Barney's went down pre-COVID. Uh, Neiman Marcus was teetering pre-COVID, went down. Um, many other retailers, will. brands have gone down. John Barbados went down. Um, and these are all, you know, in some cases, Chapter 11 uh, reorganizations, but, but in other cases, really, you know, really actual liquidation, effectively. Um, so how are you navigating uh, your exposure to wholesale accounts? Because you do have a great wholesale presence. Uh, yeah. You know, for a relatively small brand, you're in, you're in every major door. Um, by major, I mean, obviously, you're at a luxury price point. So, you know, it, the door is somewhat self-select. But how are you looking at that in the future and, um, you know, insulating that risk to the extent you can? Um, it's a terrible time out there. I would say it's a good time to be on your way up in terms of growth without having gone too, too far too quickly. And I always wanted to grow quickly and we have grown quickly. Um, the best thing that happened is when Barney's, which is where I launched, when they became, as they became a smaller and smaller piece of our wholesale pie, it was a, it was a blessing even though, you know, you have these, as a designer and as a brand, you have these dreams of these huge accounts the bigger the accounts, the more they can cripple you when, if they have trouble. Um, so I would say if there's, a, if there's some kind of, a, of portfolio equivalent to how we handle our wholesale accounts, it's diverse enough between domestic, international, uh, risky, stable. It's diverse enough that I'm very, very relieved that we haven't been destroyed during this time. And I think that comes from the fact that no one store going out of business would put us out of business. Um, I would say the best thing that we've done also is we've been in a position where we can, it's, this is a time where you kind of have to work with your partners and you have to see the stores as partners. It's a community. Um, everyone remembers each other over the years when you've been, been there for them, when they've been there for you. And I would say that right now, we, from the very beginning, we made it a point to be personally in touch with every single store we work with, every buyer, how are you guys doing? What do you need? Look, are you gonna be ready if we're ready to receive stuff? And so the communication has been a priority to make sure that you know what's going on so that we were able to actually, again, by being a kind of hands-on company, and as much as I would like to distance myself from certain things, the fact that I can get on the phone with someone and say, hey, tell me why you need to reduce that order that much. Let me know what's going on. And I can make that decision and very quickly stop us from overproducing. That has been a blessing right now. It's been able to like decide when to cut back, um, making hard decisions like 
offering, not offering a discount to stores who really need them, but to reduce the number of styles so that we still maintain our margins and what we're delivering them without just kind of killing the product. Um, but of course, as we all know, it's a great time if you have been, if you're not playing catch up on direct to consumer. So it happens to be that we started two years ago, really for a company that has been built on the wholesale model. My company is absolutely, as you said, with an artisanal unique product, I have relied heavily on the amazing wholesale accounts to be my, to be my display, my global display window. And it's worked, but just somehow we were on it enough to realize that a business can't sustain itself that way. And two years ago, we really started to focus on e-com and our direct consumer model and what, it, what works for us. We've, we've, Hopefully others are enjoying the same success, but we've broken our monthly records for e-com during this time. And I think that's because we recognized it, we're ready for it and stayed on it. And through the Zoom models and through this technology just said, hey, this is not a time to go dark. This is a time to be present, to be communicating, to, to message and almost, almost work, you know, double the pace that we were specifically on that because that's all we got right now. And, and a lot of stock, a lot of inventory. So, you know. Well, the way you built the business um, did have that sort of escape valve, so to speak, of when you're doing your own production, it's just walking out on the floor and saying, hey guys, stop. <laughs> As opposed to picking up the phone to your partner in China or Italy or wherever, where yeah. you paid for it and trying to get them to stop. Um, but you have done a great job as well, building out, uh, you know, your, your e-com capabilities and, and, you know, good to hear that that's just, uh, that's, that's really starting to pick up steam. Uh, you know, yeah. People are still buying and, um, you know, back to sense of occasion or something that makes your day or your week, you know, I, I buy here and there during this time and it's really nice when, when something comes in. And you get to experience the brand, albeit, you know, through just the boxing and, you know, the personal notes and everything. But um, it, it is those brands that, that can distinguish themselves through that, I think, will continue to be winners. Um, but back to sort of another area of the business which is shifting, but which you have traditionally participated in. What do you think of seasonless ripping that playbook up and, and, and going back to really just two seasons and mm -hmm. perhaps not showing as traditionally. I know you've, you've traditionally shown and you've shown in yeah. Paris, in New York. Um, what's the plan there? So this is probably the most frustrating part of it. Um, speaking for myself, I can say that it's very frustrating to have started out with a kind of rebellious spirit and a kind of uh, I'm going to do it my way kind of thing, season or no season. Um, but then, like everybody who at one point is trying to be anti-establishment, when you get your first taste of success within the establishment, you jump on. And I would say that what needs to be figured out is the, the, the pressure of the cycle, the pressure of the schedule is definitely too much. And it's been, as everyone is saying, it is, it is impossible to deliver quality product at the pace with which we were trying to deliver it, both in terms of the product, the messaging, imagery, um, the speed and the, the total consumption and, and excessive nature of everybody out there. And, and the biggest problem is that the smallest percentage of people who were paying attention to like the earliest part of the cycles are who we started catering to. And so you, you, this model of showing so early so that you can deliver in time so that you can deliver early has kind of killed the whole system because then at a certain point, you know, there's always been this question of who is really buying their clothing, what, what's really the percentage of people that are buying their clothing the minute it hits the stores versus the, the, the in-season buying that people used to enjoy. September used to mean summer is over, 
I want to go shopping. I want that amazing experience. There's new windows, new product. In, in September and October, October in New York used to feel like the most magical time to shop because you were thinking about, I need an amazing tweed jacket or that lightweight jacket to walk through Central Park as the leaves start to turn. For the last five years, we've been, or longer, we've been asking people to think about that in June. While they're in 90 degree weather somewhere, hey, don't you wanna wear this cashmere thing in October, November? Think about that now as you're dripping with sweat and trying that piece on. Um, I think what's gonna be fascinating is there'll be a lot of trial and error. I know that speaking for what we're trying to do is how do you create something that is exciting, that is immersive, that has a message in trying to show a collection, the, the freedom that we all now suddenly have is also terrifying. And it's also, it's almost easier when someone says, this is how you do it. Um, it's exciting and it's a little scary because how do you do that? If we're, if we're used to going to Paris to show the collection, show stores, they can touch it, they can feel it, I can be there to tell them about it, we can do a presentation, and then you have the imagery, there's a format that within that format, we all try to be as creative as possible. Now we're questioning the format. So it's kind of like, do we do a, a fashion show online? Do you, what kind of interesting technology can we use to bring people to us? Because I think that's the big theme that I'm looking at is fashion weeks have always been about going there. And I love the opportunity and my sort of approach to this is going to be, how can I bring them to me now? through this new medium, um, whatever that looks like, you know, words like authenticity, um, creativity, sustainability are what are important to me. From a technological standpoint, I think that, that people getting to meet and feel the voice and the person behind the brand is probably gonna be more important than ever because I think people are looking for brands that are clear about who they are. And I think that the more we as designers are confident and clear about what we're trying to do, what that message is, and to know who, who we are. I think that, that that'll give us the best chance at thriving during a time where people are kind of, they're looking for that. I want to know what the Greg Lauren brand is and why now should I care about it, you know? Yeah. Well, many brands have done this through, through either the founder or head designer's social media feed or the brand's social media feed, obviously. You and your wife, Elizabeth, uh, for, for the one listener who might not know Elizabeth Berkeley, your wife, actress, you, you have tremendous followings. But heretofore, because I follow both of you, I don't see a lot of commerce going on. And that's refreshing. That's a nice thing. Uh, there are a lot of feeds that look like catalogs. Um, is that deliberate by you? Is that something that you feel might need to change? Or would that be something you would do through really the business's social media feed as opposed to your personal? Um, it is really interesting because I would tell you that I am definitely one of the people that I, I, I'm going to use this word as gently and diplomatically as possible. I really don't like Instagram. Um, for, for bigger social reasons. I just think that it's incredibly dangerous, incredibly toxic. Um, and for the most part, I, I am gonna generalize and say that for the most part, I think it's, it's mostly negative. Um, I think that out of it, there are some jewels, there are treasures, there are some great things um, that you can learn about. As a brand, you must use it. So there is no way around that. You must use it, you must make peace with it. I made a shift a few years ago to, I never saw it, I, I was never interested in, in using it as a tool to show my personal life or display it or, or to me it was always about just trying to be authentic and more recently I decided that my feed would, would be, I've chosen not to do that device where I don't have currently, I don't have a personal one and a, prof, and a brand one. And I think that the way that, the reason that that is actually succeeded for us as a brand is that it ends up feeling more like somewhere between a personal and a brand one. And that's, for me, that's my goal. I always want people to feel 
even if it's just in the graphic that we use or the approach to a post that is of a, of a, of a product, I still want it to feel personal, human, somebody made this, you know, our, I'm excited right now about all the graphics we're using that I came up with, which that has this kind of collage effect because yes, it's a product, but it's storytelling. And I want people to see that and know that there's a human behind this. And it's not just part of a marketing plan, a marketing strategy. And we're posting this because we have to, even if we are conscious of deadlines or holidays, or we need to post this because this is happening now, I still want to make it personal. Um, Elizabeth is amazing because she could be posting every day and she has chosen to really hold back and post things when she wants to, when they mean something to her. And others could say to her, hey, if you want to turn this into a, a commercial business, you need to be doing this and you need to be doing that. And maybe she will when she, when she does that, I can guarantee you this, it would only be as authentic as who she is. And um, for somebody that has a lot going on for, you know, as you know, we have the Saved by the Bell reboot is, is they shot most of it. It's on hold. Uh, they're going to finish up, finish it up very quickly uh, as soon as this is over. But um, she has a lot going on and that she could be posting about. And she will often choose to post something sort of quiet and spiritual or that could have a positive ripple effect in something that is either, you know, that could be perceived as showing off or, or that's just not who she is. So I think it just depends on who you are. I see way too many people, even during this pandemic, posting things that really could only possibly make people feel bad about their stay at home life versus others. And I think that um, it's tricky. It's just a choice. You know, yeah. I like when Instagram kind of shares something that you can take away something positive from it, something that you enjoy rather than a kind of look at me approach. Well, I think my Corona cut is paling good. into your, your sort of elder of the tribe beard growth, which I'm, <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the Travolta cut, which you've, you've been rocking for decades now, but, um, unfortunately we're out of time. That is a wrap. Greg, thanks so much for coming on. And, um, I'll just call this part one and we'll see if this is perhaps an eight part series, but uh, sell it to Netflix. I think we need a good 10 episodes to really, to really cover everything. All right. Sounds good, man. Be thanks, well, Doug. Stay safe. And uh, thanks everybody for watching. Bye Thank now. you. Thanks everyone. Bye. You've been listening to the laws of style with Douglas hand. For more information, go to our website at www.hba llp.com and you can also follow us on instagram and twitter at at hand of the law thank you for tuning in and stay stylish